what kind of stuff were we talking about last week? Who can remember what we were talking about last week? Grace is just gonna turn over her nose. Huh. <coughs> can anybody remember? Yeah. We're defining discipleship. Yes. Uh, That's how we started the lesson. Yes. <laughs> what are the three ethical challenges? Does anybody remember the three ethical challenges, Gracie? Do not dare read them off. Pride. Pride greed, greed. And lust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You guys are awesome. <laughs> and uh, let's see what else they were talking about. Signs of discipleship? Yes. That's one of the things we're ending it with, too. Um, with this whole Second Timothy thing, did any of you guys read Second Timothy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I read it. I just forgot to write stuff down. Okay. Well, do you have anything <laughs> in your head that, that popped out? No, don't say it yet. Just do you have anything? Not really. Okay. All right. That's fine. <laughs> At least you read it. That's a starting point. <laughs> I didn't read it. Uh uh. Hooligans. 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 Oh my god. All right. I specifically told you guys last week that the conversation would be very short if you guys didn't do that. <laughs> Lucky for me, I anticipated your imminent failure and I added extra stuff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, oh, uh -huh. Today I was in my office and I was like, oh, what if they don't do their homework? I was like, they'll, they'll do it. And I was like, wait, no, they won't. And I was like, oh, I better answer this lesson quick. <laughs> so, okay. I just didn't want that to go to waste. So. <laughs> It would have come up later, Chuck. <laughs> Alright, so if you had a follower who was to carry on your work, the spirit of who you are and what you were doing, what would you expect of him? Sasher? Well, he better do his homework. Oh, snap. <laughs> Ouch. Because you do so often. What do you expect? He works with teenagers all day. What do you expect? <laughs> I mean, what do you guys think? I don't know if I want to necessarily have them carry on what I do, but um. carry on the the uh, knowledge and information that I gave them and um, make something of themselves. I see what you're trying to do. It's not appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a follower who is to carry on your work in spirit, the essence like of who you are. supposed to do for Jesus. Yes. Oh. You're not supposed to be creative with the question. You're supposed to be creative with the answer. Answer. What would you expect of that person in order to do that? So take that creative energy, but put it towards the answer instead of redefining the question. <laughs> <laughs> Woman. Read the journals I wanted to write. <laughs> well, what? Read the journals I wanted to write? What? <laughs> Read the journals I Well, you know, we're, we're, we're called God's children, and we're expected to follow, you know, God's example and everything that he's laid out for us. And in that same respect... You're I not going to redefine the question, no, are you? Okay, in that same God. respect, <laughs> you know, we have our own children, so I think, what, what do I want my kids to take away from me? The good things, not the bad things, you know? And obviously, you know, I want my kids to be, I want them to seek God and I want them to follow the direction that, that God has laid on their heart. You know, I want them to, I want them to be involved um, in whatever way God has it. You know, like, I don't want them to think that there's only certain, you know, places, you know, oh, I have to be in ministry, I have to do this or that. I want them to, to be sure that they're, that they're doing what God has laid on their heart and not just what they think is expected of them as Christians, you know. And so I guess if I wanted someone to carry on, you know, my work in spirit, it would be obviously everybody's job is to love and serve other people. Well, you know, we're all called to do that. And so I want to see my kids obviously love and serve people and put God first 
and truly do what God has directed them to do and not just what they think is expected of them. I, I want them to truly be connected with God and, and truly be doing whatever it is that God has laid on their heart. So let me Fearlessly. reword this. Let me reword this in a different way. I like, I like where we're going, but I, let's move it a different way then. Um, you are on your deathbed. You are dying. You've got, I don't know, Serena's at least got five minutes. Maybe some of you guys have seven, but Serena's got five. <laughs> and you are talking to the person who's going to finish the work that you started. The only thing that you're ever going to be remembered for in life, and it's their job to complete it. And go. Oh, dear. Uh... You've got five minutes, guys. The clock is ticking. What do you want them to finish in your stead? What defines you? What, what drove you throughout your whole life? You're now 70. You're about to die. You've got five minutes left. Well, four minutes now. This is a really hard question. That's why I gave you a week to think about it. <laughs> this is why. <laughs> Nicole, what do you think? First thing that comes to your head, what do you think? Well, I wouldn't want them to make stuff up. Okay, like what do you mean? Just try to keep everything as truthful and as the same way as I had it. Just keep it on the same level. Okay. So try to try stay to true to you. Up. Okay. All right, Gracie. Um, first thing that popped in my head was hope the people will orphans. Okay. So you would you would want them to them to help orphans. Okay, all right, Chuck. I mean, I'm sorry, not you, Chuck. Zach. Um, Role playing will help. Yes, sir. What do you want before you die? <laughs> Anything, you name it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, Two minutes left, guys. Better be important. I'll, I'll switch this. Check. You keep thinking. Check. I would want them to continue what I'm, the work that I'm doing with you. Okay. In the area. Okay. So you'd want. Okay. So and it's to just. Expand it. Okay. All right. Serena. I would want that. I would want them to never give up on people. And for them to never now lose there's, hope. Now there's there's some good. I'm, I'm liking where you're going now. And to never give up hope, and to continue to reach out to people, even the ones that seem completely lost and hopeless. I just don't ever want them to give up on people. There we go, Zach. Oh gee, <laughs> how can I follow that? No, you guys are all giving good answers now that you're giving answers. <laughs> Blink. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> okay, don't worry. You guys have all died now, and you're just happy right now, <laughs> having to fulfill your work. <laughs> so it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, Check, Serena, Nicole, and Gracie had you back there, buddy. <laughs> just kidding. That's kind of the, that's kind of the the pressure that I want you guys to feel. The idea of the essence of. What would you want that disciple to carry on? The, the essence of you, how would they do that? What would be you that would need to be carried on? Some of us were, were more obvious things like, you know, Chuck, youth, hello, duh. But then some of us were a little bit less obvious, like Gracie with, with the orphan thing, you know what I mean? That's kind of... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but see... The, the, when you start thinking seriously about this, what would I want to be remembered for? What, do I, what, do I, what, do I, what would I want this person to, to emphasize? You know, and so that kind of brings us to the question of, what do you think God wants from you as his disciple, and you're carrying on his spirit? So, I mean, what was important to Jesus? And that brings us to the core of what discipleship is. 
Because discipleship, remember, it's that following after Christ. It's that not just, oh, I'm a Christian. You know, it's actually being something different. And it's actually doing something different. Remember, we were talking about the purpose, the goals, the, 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 the direction in your life. You remember we were talking about this? Mm-hmm. And that's because we're carrying on God's vision. Okay? So just something to think about. And whenever you think about you as a disciple, always come back to this. Am I carrying on the work in the Spirit of Christ? Because that's all, that's all emphasis of everything we're going to be talking about over the next couple weeks. Today we're going to continue with the introductory things with discipleship. Then we're going to talk about uh, discipline in, in life and in church scenarios next week. Um, also we're going to deal with the question of if you know it, we're free from the law, why do we have to pursue you know, Christian discipline? So, I mean, why, why does there have to be discipline within a church? Why don't we all just forgive and hug it out? So, I mean, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the week after that, we'll be looking at, um, well, I don't want to give it away too much, but we'll continue building on that. And then we're going to get into some more core principles of, of self-image and um, um, addiction problems and that kind of stuff, um, which all kind of just wraps itself around a discipleship, what it means to be a disciple, and what, what is expected of disciples. So, um, anything else before I go to the next thing you hear? Okay. What signs of discipleship did you find in St. Timothy, Gracie? <laughs> well, the main thing I saw was um, Paul was encouraging Timothy. Okay. Um, when it kind of, do you have anything that you wanted to lo- us to look at, or anything specific that you wanted to um, say about that? Well, I mean, like I, I like I have the verses now with the different points that I wrote down. Do we want to look up any of them, or were you just wanting to blow through? Um, do you want me to blow through? Uh, whatever you think, if there was something that really stuck out to you, obviously I don't want you to go for like 10 or 15 minutes, but you know, was there anything that stuck out? No, it just seemed like, I don't know if Timothy was like in a bad place at this point, but um, it just seems like he kind of went through um, the whole Christian thing and, you know, just know stay encouraged don't do this uh, stay with these people um, do this um, don't get discouraged you're gonna get um, persecuted it's okay because we're doing this for Christ and we're doing it for more people to be, know Christ and uh, I just saw encouragement too about that thing does anybody know, know the context of singing Timothy what was going on so we know Okay, so Second Timothy was written about 67 AD. Now, um, well, really any time between 65, 66, anywhere in there, really. Uh, what had happened was there was an emperor by the name of Nero um, who well, was ruling in Rome. I thought that was kind of obvious. but <laughs> uh, And a fire oh, was started in, in Rome, um, which... Nero needed to kind of a scapegoat for it because everybody just kind of blamed it on Nero as the eccentric and, you know, oh, it's all Nero's fault. Um, and so he looked for a scapegoat and he found it in the Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ended up persecuting them and, and, and whatnot, um, killing them and all that. Um, eventually, um, uh, he ended up killing himself uh, about 67, and that's when the church persecution uh, stopped from Rome at, at that uh, caliber and kind of went back a few notches. Um, but in the meantime, Paul uh, had been in, imprisoned in Rome, as the end of a, uh, the book of Acts records, but then he'd been let go. And so he went on one last missionary journey, and he came back to Rome. He was arrested again. And both him and the apostle Peter are, are arrested in Rome, and they're both, you know, awaiting their time. And they take their last inventory of stuff that's you know that they want to that they want to pass on before they go, and Paul's last account was Second Timothy. This was his last statement, his his last words of anything that he wanted to pass on. And Timothy was his uh, closest pupil, if you will, um, and then Peter handed on handed down Second Peter about the same time, um, and Paul ends up dying. Uh, but Timothy was supposed to continue the work at a church at the church in Ephesus. 
Now, Paul had spent a good deal of time with a few different churches. Uh, Corinth was a church that, that, that had a slew of problems that Paul had to continually address there for like a whole couple year period. But then uh, Ephesus, he spent a three year segment there in one of his missionary um, trips. And uh, so he had a strong tie to this church, um, and he was handing it down to someone who he saw was capable. But nevertheless, when you're faced with death, I mean, these are the last words Paul went in to make sure that they were conveyed. Um, and this was the core of, for, for Paul of what it meant for him to be a disciple of Christ and what it meant um, what he wanted to see Timothy continue to do. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the heart of Second Timothy. Um, and so he ends up dying, dying in uh, dying in Rome, and, and with that, a kind of a new a new age of the church is is um, kind of set upon. Is you know the, the the Jewish rebellion starts there in a little bit, and then in about seventy A.D., just a few years afterwards, Jerusalem ends up getting burned to the ground, and so everything's just an upheaval, and, and, and the Christian base has moved, you know, and everything just kind of goes haywire, um, and that's one of the things that Gracie brought up is is you know. Paul was being persecuted, and there was a lot of persecution going on in Rome um, and in other various places. But uh, Paul, I think, foresaw a time when it would be worse than what it was, um, and that's one of the things that he that he tries to kind of anticipate the future. Um, was there any one point that you wanted to point out before I go? And so Second Timothy obviously is just packed full of different different um, different keys of discipleship. Um, I'll even I'll even read just this first part just to kind of show you um, how Paul picks up with his last letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Notice instantly that 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 transition there of playing on the life in Christ Jesus. We're going to see a lot of dark tones, and yet, you know, he, he starts off there with the life of Christ. See, I mean, he knew what was coming with him, coming ahead. But notice the contrast throughout the letter of hope in the midst of death. See, I mean, joy in the midst of persecution. See, I mean, um, just a lot of strong contrast throughout Second Timothy. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, now, Timothy was not actually his literal biological child. Uh, they were just extremely close. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Can you just hear that kind of um, heart in him? You know, kind of like that... Um, uh, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, define, but you can just kind of hear that tone. You know, he, he knows what's coming, and he's kind of at peace with it, and he's just facing with the last things they have to... Um, that he has to deal with. So, um, one of the things that Paul uh, talks about pretty quickly is people who raise up other people. A mark of a disciple is that the discipleship work is an ongoing process, and as a result of the consistency in their own life, they're always impacting and influencing other people too. When I say discipling people, I'm not talking about sitting them down in front of you and teaching them about the Bible, although that can be discipleship, okay? I'm more talking about the impact that you have on another human being. Um, so 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, You then, my child, be strengthened by the graces in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, remember, carrying on the spirit of somebody, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. See that process, that continual handing off. Um, it was shown to me, as uh, taught to me, I guess I, sh I should say, as uh, kind of like the Olympic thing, you know, where you're handing off the baton, uh, right. you know, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I heard one person say, uh, I believe it was Hans Finzel. The book was Top Ten Mistakes Leaders Make. Yes. And he made the statement that you are training up your heir the instant that you get a new position. So you're always training up someone else to take up after you, regardless of whether you realize it or not. But his point was to be intentional about it. Because right? what we do is we get in a position, 
and we just kind of see ourselves as the permanent fixture. But people just don't live that long. <laughs> so, uh, the second thing we see with, with uh, discipleship is kind of the idea of just getting involved. Um, in, in verse 9 of chapter 1, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through gospel, through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. So kind of this idea of just getting involved in things. You, if you picked it up there um, throughout the whole thing, but especially there, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's one of the things of, about discipleship is that idea of a purpose on your life. You have a calling on your life regardless of whether it's into ministry or not. You have a calling on your life um, as a disciple of Christ. Um, and we're going to look at uh, uh, some things with getting involved uh, in ministry um, at the end of the lesson. Um, also we see here comparing yourself and your goals to Jesus in chapter 2 verse 8 through 10 remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead the offspring of David has preached in my gospel for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal but the word of God is not bound therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect so that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory so another mark of discipleship is the idea of um continuing to align your thoughts with with Christ, kind of comparing the two. Uh, Is this matching up with the kingdom of God, or is this something that's all about me? Um, Continually seek God, chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the the word of truth. And then verse 21 Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Some people are called to missionary work, and some people are just called to do what they've been doing, just with a different heart. You know what I mean? You can't honestly tell me that the stay-at-home mom is any less called by God than somebody, than, you know, what was his name? The, the guy that went to China um, in the missions... Um, in the 1890-1900 section, uh, Taylor, or uh, Hudson Taylor, or uh, oh, Grace, help me out with this. Um, what? I think that was right. Hudson Taylor? Mm-hmm. Is that right it is? Uh, man, my, my, my missions history is real rusty. But it was in the 1890-1900s, um, and, and he started you know this, this awesome missionary work in China to have people that had never had a missionary. And he just amazing work and, and started this whole thing and, and from it, you know, generations later, people are still modeling their mission missions efforts uh, after his. Mm. I just wish I could remember for sure what his name was. Are you looking that up? Thanks. That's going to bother me if you don't. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> the idea of continually seeking after God and everybody has a calling on their life just to different places and to do different things. You know, sometimes we have this idea that I'm not as important if I don't do the same thing that he does because he gets public, you know, acclaim and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was, uh, Hudson Taylor? Yeah. But stay-at-home moms are called by God, too. So, I mean, like, I, I understand what the feminist movement is trying to do, but with all that set aside, let me just come back with this. Women are equally important in the gospel story as men are, and there is nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home mom. Some people might not want that. Some people do want that. There's nothing wrong with it either way. With that being said, though, uh, God does call us to different things. Mm. Maintain a a proper demeanor and be an example. By demeanor, I mean a a, a character or um, personality. Uh, What? Being good character. Kind of, yeah, yeah. At all times, yeah. Um, Yeah. And being an example. Chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being uh, captured by him to do his will. So, um, and then one more. Um, also, uh, the mark of a, of a disciple is going past a parent's religion. Disciples don't do things because it's what they do. Disciples do things because 
their master told them to do it. You know what I mean? Um, you have to get out of this idea of, I'm a Christian because my parents are a Christian or whatever, and you have to actually critically analyze your faith. You know what I mean? And, and make it where it's actually living and active for you. You know what I mean? Because if you're just living a dead religion, it profits you nothing. If, you, if there's no encounter with Christ, it profits you nothing. You're just simply following, following through motions. And Isaiah the prophet talked about this thousands, hundreds of, or thousands of years ago when he said, um, you know, those people worship me with, with, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God always desires that, um, that inner spirit's submission to him over doing all the right things. He always, always uh, enjoys that more. So chapter 1, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. See what he said there? It, it was in, You had that heritage of faith passed on down to you, but then he said, I'm sure of your sincere faith. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. um, and now I, I, I am sure that it dwells in you as well. I am sure that this is something that has actually taken root. Um, once again, those those marks of discipleship, that it's not just something that this is, this is Pa's religion. This is your religion, you know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm using religion in, in the most broadest sense. I'm not using it in the sense of, you know, going through the, you know what I mean. So, just a few things about discipleship. Discipleship goes, a, goes past me. Because with discipleship, you have to realize, and, and this might seem like a simple statement, we're going to build a lot on this, with lust... Uh, and with greed and, and with pride, um, a lot on this idea of getting past me. Because in life, we have this kind of... We're preoccupied with ourselves a large majority of the time. What's what's best for our comfort? Uh, what's best for, for who we are? You know, a lot of times, well, I just don't really want to do that. That's just not comfortable for me. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, and, and so with the subship, it goes past that. It goes, it goes towards, you know... Is this where God is calling me to? Is this something where I might not like it per se, but is this something that I know is the right thing to do? You know what I mean? Um, this means sometimes overlooking promotions. This means sometimes overlooking a better job. This means sometimes um, overlooking making a purchase. So this this means sometimes sometimes either going back to school like Serena did. Uh, or maybe not going back to school, as some other people that I know did. Um, you know, it's, it's that, is it the right thing to do? You know what I mean? Past what's convenient. Um, does, does discipleship sees life events as opportunities? Um, one, of the, one of the greatest problems with discipleship is when you start getting preoccupied with the way that things disrupt your plans. You know what I mean? And if you've lived longer than 18, you've probably had at least a few plans that went down the crapper. Uh -huh. It just doesn't take that long in life for your plans to go to hell. However, it's like, uh, it's like Pastor was saying the other day, um, uh, when he was doing that ministry and that person was always being a thorn, a thorn in his side. And he was praying, God, this person's getting in the way of his ministry. And then God said, no, 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 that person is your ministry. See so, you know what I mean? It's exactly that same thing. Um, sometimes the greatest inconveniences in life are actually just another stepping stone in the process of discipleship. See, we think, oh, well, this thing came up and it completely destroyed my plans. But how God sees it is, here's another thing to grow up this person into another step of discipleship. So what we do is when we when we fell and we trip over that, we, we immediately think, oh, this is just it. Whereas God's saying, okay, now that he's fallen, I can raise him up to something else. See, I mean, God sees... Season Let's just put it like this. Do it. He sees it in a different perspective. Yeah. Think of it like this. Uh, this is actually a great example. Um, does everyone know what 2D is? Where you, where you can only see, th you know, you, you see yeah, th yeah, like a video game. Too. Right. Yeah. Um, we see things kind of a 2D way. You know, mm -hmm. this is just, how, oh, this is not going well. Whereas God's seeing it like from all perspectives, he's just like, okay, well, this is actually where I'm leading you to. Right. You know, and, and sometimes it'll be so much greater than, than we ever planned. But I think what really bothers us is that we didn't plan it. Yeah. yeah the you know meeting, I mean? think of it ourselves. Yeah. It, we, we like to feel like we are in control of our lives. We, yeah. we like to feel like we know what's going to be around the next curve. We like to know that 
that life is going to have some kind of consistency in it. Right. But with discipleship, a lot of the majority of the times, it's not going to be that. It's going to be trusting in God on a day-to-day basis because things are just being turned around. So, um, discipleship is living different. Discipleship is choosing not to live according to how the world does things. Discipleship is setting yourself apart for God's purposes. You're living a different structured life rather than just going out and wasting your life. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people that I actually met at the, I don't think I could say it on this recording, at the call center. <laughs> yeah, at the call center, mm-hmm. um, where um, they would use all their, save up all their money all week, even even put in extra hours and then spend it all on partying in the weekend. I, I don't understand the process, but I mean, the, they really look forward to the weekends. Uh, Monday monkey lives for the weekend, sir. <laughs> Future drama, I'm sorry. Anyways, uh, what was I saying? Uh, but it's that idea of, of, of setting yourself apart from those things. The things that the world calls wisdom. Like, here's another example. CEOs spend their whole life to organize, organize a company to make more money, right? What if I told you that had absolutely nothing to do with what life was really about? It would blow their minds. See what mm-hmm. I mean? And that's what I'm talking about. Refraining from the things that the world says, this this is this is what you need. And setting yourself on a different structure. Where, where we don't do things like go out and party and, 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 and get drunk and, 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 and sleep around and all these different things. We don't, we don't do those things. Because we live a disciplined life. So, um, discipleship avoids the cult. Um, or the occult. Um, so, in other words, um, if you notice, there are no, there are no pagan things hanging on my wall. Right. See what I mean, there are no. Um, when you walk in, there's no weird objects over the door. There's a, there's a Jesus fish over the door. Okay, we went to the Grace and I went to this one shop. Mm-hmm. So I walk in. I don't see it. Right. Right. I mean, we get some ice cream. We're doing our thing. And then I decided to take a look around the shop. They've got like a, cha- a, a what is it called? A charm over the door. They've got a Ouija board in the corner. It just so it just gets really weir- weird really quick. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, Gracie, eat your ice cream. Let's go. Let's go. It was just weird. And the people acted kind of strange too. You know what I mean? Like, here, funny, but a bit kind of funny. Um, and with the sabership, oftentimes in life. The world will tell you that something looks cool or that's popular or whatever, and in discipleship you kind of refrain from those kinds of things, you know what I mean? You guys know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, yeah. Well, since we brought it up so many times before, the Kachina dolls, uh, why not? We brought it up so many times before. Refraining from those kinds of things that are connected with the occult because it doesn't glorify God. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? The, no other, well, the, you can have other reasons, but the main reason being... It doesn't glorify God. See what I mean? Where you re-establish your whole goals is does it glorify God? And we'll talk more about this later. So, um, discipleship is as abstaining from what is not of benefit. I just mentioned this, um, and one of the things I keep I, I keep bringing up is the idea: it doesn't matter can I do something; it matters should I do this. The idea of who's the master of your life? God, you, money. What, what's the what's the master of your life? And then being submitted to that and putting out the things of your life that aren't a benefit either to you or to God's kingdom or anything, really. Um, some of the people I see argue the most that Christians can drink are ruled the most by alcohol. See what I mean? And God doesn't desire for you to live a life of bondage. Um, Discipleship responds to life with prayer and fellowship. Um, this, uh, a lot of times you see this where people will get hurt in a church situation so they will withdraw. So they will withdraw. Or um, uh, a bad situation will come by and they'll withdraw to themselves. You know, like, like I see some people who lose their kids, for instance, and I have no idea what that must feel like to, to lose your child. I, I, don't, I don't know what that must feel like, but um, I know that God doesn't desire for us to withdraw from people and to withdraw from Him. So, I mean, as the situations come up, he desires that we push farther in to him. Um, any questions on any of this so far? Um, also, discipleship has a series has a series of things that are extreme, and I think sometimes people downplay 
a lot of this extremeness. Okay, so we're gonna look at these, and if you have any questions about what I'm saying, stop me, okay? The first extreme of discipleship is that your family is literally forsaken in a way. Now, before you get too upset at me for what I'm saying here, I've heard all my life, family is, it, it, are those people you're blood related to. And yet, I have a hard time finding a biblical basis for this in the Bible. Oftentimes, in my experience, I've seen family be the ones who weren't there for people a lot of times. You know what I mean? Whereas sometimes I have seen them step up. Uh, a lot of ten times I, I haven't seen them step up. Um, a good example of this is, is Serena's mom recently um, lost her husband. And Serena was there for her. Do you know what I mean? The exa that example of blood family actually being there for her. But there are other examples that I can think of where um, something will happen and the family will withdraw from each other, push each other away. Um, if there's a member of the family that, that uh, either um, is trying to work through a homosexual kind of thing or, or maybe has come out as homosexual, they're pushed off, whereas complete strangers welcome them as, as family. You see what I mean? Where, where a lot of times blood and flesh aren't really family. And with discipleship, we see this once again where discipleship goes past blood and it welcomes into us into a whole new bigger family and that takes us to Matthew chapter 12 as a Christian our families will um, one way or another in different ways throughout our life uh, abandon us in different ways but you have to realize that our true family is God's family in Matthew chapter 12 verse 48 um, it says this but he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See what he's saying there? Oftentimes our family will abandon us. Um, Keith Green, a, a Christian musician, uh, his family was Jewish and they abandoned him because he converted to, to Christianity. And in times like those... I mean, we'll all, they'll always be related to us, you know what I mean? And there's that bond that can never be broken. But at the same time, um, our family throughout the Bible is always shown to be the believers. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we're called to accept each other with, with our flaws, with, with, our, with our differences and everything. Now, I'm not saying we're called to not, um, you know, hey, you can just live however you want. And we all just have to accept your stupid decisions. That's not what I'm saying at all. We have to accept each other past our stupid decisions. Right. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's say Serena says, you know what? I'm going to... Um, I'm going to divorce Sam, and I'm going to give my kids up to the state, and I'm going to go get a different job, and I'm going to move. Now, I would disagree with what she's doing, and I think I would have biblical basis for why I would disagree with that, but let's go with me on this. I would still have to accept Serena as a person without accepting what she has decided to do. See, does that make sense? And although the things that she has done is wrong and in need of correction, and she need, she has an area of her life that would need to be corrected, um, so I'm not condoning the sin, but I'm still called, see what I mean, to love her as a sister. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, And we'll get into... Um, people abandoning the faith, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. Uh, but sometimes even Christians go through times of struggling and stumbling and dark times. Mm -hmm. So he's not getting divorced. Okay. All right. I'm not giving my kids up. Well, <laughs> let's see how they do in school. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> the school year is young. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyways, uh, and so in one way this is inten This is very intense. Because sometimes we have to pick God over family. And that can be very hard. But then in another way, this is a comfort for those people who have been abandoned by their family and now have a new family. So, I mean, so it's a, what is it the monk always says? It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> and so it's kind of like that. Um, but also there's the idea of death to self. In order to follow Christ, you really have to, to die. Your desires, your passions, they have to die. And that's kind of a big, hard pill to swallow. I mean... You know, you ever seen those really big pills like that? And you're like, oh my gosh, I have to swallow that and I can't crush it? Hmm. Oh, buddy, I had one of those as a kid. But anyways, um, 
And it's kind of like that. Uh, 16, uh, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. Are you seeing the contrast right there? Mm-hmm. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Basically, if you want to do this, let him deny his, his, his desires. Wait, why isn't that a contradiction there, Jesus? Uh, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, so it's the idea of, of that self-sacrifice, that, um, that, that death to, to self. That's a hard thing to do, especially in the American culture. We treasure materialism above everything else. If you don't watch out for number one, who will? See what I mean? That's the American mentality. It goes against all of that. And so it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and we'll talk about this more. Um, another thing is uh, passions. <clears throat> Your passions being submitted. Uh, chapter 8, verse 19 through 20. I thought it was 18, but I guess not. Maybe it is 18. Because I was pretty sure it was 18. Okay, here we go. Yes, it is chapter 8. I'm sorry. Verse 19. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. See, we like to pray prayers like this. Lord, I pray you'd provide for uh, rent so I can live in my house. What if... God doesn't want you to live in that house, and you end up living in the street. Do you know I mean? Discipleship. Yeah. Are you actually following Christ, or are you just following blessings and things that you want for your life? Do you know I mean? Once you actually start putting those things under, under the magnifying glass there, it gets a little bit more, I want to say scary? What if, uh, what if God decides to take your car from you? See what I mean? Like, these are things that, that do happen, you know. Um, are, are, are our passions submitted to God where God could do something like that and we're okay with it once we're following Him? Where um, we don't desire for our things to happen. See what I mean? Like, Serena, I'm assuming you, you want to get your degree, right? Mm-hmm. This is something you actually desire, right? Yeah. Okay, now go, up, go out on a hypothetical with me. What if God says, you know what, Serena, I don't want you to get that degree. See what I mean? Just to, now, I don't, I'm not expecting like an answer, but um, <laughs> think of that, think of that where, where you're working towards something. This is your goal in life, and all of a sudden, God just changes that. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Are your passions submitted to God? That's the salvation. Were you giving up of what you want for you, and you're saying, God, what do you want for me? Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Um, also, another really big thing that God expects of us as disciples is, is um, always something that, that, that's, that people stumble over. Offenses forsaken, that we cannot, cannot take things personally when people come against us. We have to let it go. Matthew 6.14 um, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you, but... If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me translate that in, in a different way. You have no excuse anymore to take things against yourself. You have to let them go. See what I mean? These are these are hard things. It's no wonder why a bunch of people left Jesus when he was teaching these things. These are hard things to swallow. I don't even have to like do the whole, what, what did it mean to them there? What does it mean to us here? It's basically the same thing. You're surrendering yourself to the mastering of someone else. That's a pretty big statement. Um, uh, Without worldly success, chapter 19. Verse uh, 
Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, we're going to look at look at money. Uh, I believe it's the first Tuesday of next month, so I'm not really going to get too much into this. But he was trying all these different things, and yet the thing that held his heart as God was his success and money, his things, his, his material life that was so comfortable. Um, the, I remember hearing the story of one missionary who, I mean, he was, he was well off, and um, God called him to ministry, so he sold off everything he had and just went with nothing but the clothes on his back. I mean, I would have at least packed a suitcase, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, so he gets there, and, and everything just worked out, and, you know, all this different stuff, but he had to give up everything. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, that that's kind of a hard statement. To honestly ask yourself, and I'm not looking for a show of hands or anything. Honestly, ask yourself right now. God says, "Pack up all you, all, all you, all you have. You're going to Ethiopia. I mean, not not pack up. Get, get rid of all you have. You're going to Ethiopia tomorrow. That's a hard thing to do, right? Uh-huh. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of comfortable. Uh-huh. I've got my house. I've got my office. I've got my car. I'm set. You know what I mean? Like I've got my thing going on. What if God were to ask you to give it up? See what I mean? This is the cost of discipleship. You're no longer living for the things of worldly success. And look at it like this. Let's say you don't decide to do that and you decide to go out for earthly success. Keep in mind that you're only going to be successful for your prime, which is like 20, 30 years. And then after that, you're kind of all downhill from there. and You get voted off the board and a couple divorces later. See what I mean? Like It, it doesn't work as glamorous as, as it seems. <laughs> Um, money would work out all right if it wasn't such an evil thing and if people weren't so evil of people. Other than that, money is a pretty good idea. <laughs> so, um, so just a few notes on discipleship. Um, oftentimes, I've seen people settle for bad doctrine because it comforts them in the here and now. You know what I mean? Where they'll believe something that, that a televangelist says, even though it's wrong, just because it gives them an instant of this feels good for me right now. They won't weigh it against what the Bible says or whether it's true. They'll just kind of take it and run wild. Here's a perfect example. Um, the word um, Abba, uh, Aramaic, it means father, basic, simple word. And yet, a lot of people take it and, and make this whole thing about it meaning daddy and how God wants to, you know, rock is to sleep in a rocking chair and they just turn out weird. I mean, you know what I mean? They just take it to a dark place. The reason why the Bible uses this in reference to God is because that shows that we've been completely adopted. We're no longer considered the outsider. We are considered God's son. We can call him Abba. We can call him Father because he has adopted us. So, I mean, we aren't wanderers anymore. We have a home in God's kingdom. See what I mean? That's a way bigger statement than what people try to make it with the whole daddy nonsense. But a lot of people, it brings them comfort to hear that false doctrine. Do you know what I mean? And so they cling to it because it gives them a moment of gratification. I'll give you a couple more examples. Um, a televangelist will say something about... And it's always like the same cookie cutter stuff. God has seen your struggles, and he's going to just pour out some financial blessings on you and it makes him feel really happy for that second but then we, we'd start looking at the Bible are you still wasting your money on the, the lust of the flesh are you still going out and spending it on, on drugs and on cigarettes well then you're not going to have money are you honoring God with your finances not just tithes and offering realizing that your money is not your own it is God's money and he is allowing you to use it for a limited time do you know what I mean? Are, are, are you honoring God with your finance, or with his finances? See what I mean? Are, are all these things going on? Are you repentant for the thing, for the, for the lifestyle that you're living? No? Then why does this televangelist five seconds of saying that you're going to be blessed because he said so when the whole word says you need to, you need to repent first and then you'll be blessed? Mm-hmm. See what I mean? But for whatever reason, people like to settle for that bad doctrine because it gives them a moment of, ooh, that makes me feel good. See what I mean? And discipleship means pushing that aside and saying, I'm not going to settle for things that give me a quick fix. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? 
And pastors deal with this too because we get all kinds of stuff in the mail that says, grow your church overnight. These top 10 discipleship tactics are proven to, to boost your, your, um, your congregation by 500%. And you're just like, yeah, let's do it. Why? Because it's not based on biblical truth. It's based on a hype. See what I mean? If you comb your hair a certain way, if you wear the right glasses, get the David Crowder goatee. See what I mean? But, but it's just a little quick scheme to make you feel better. But it's not actually rooted in, in, in biblical doctrine. See what I mean? And, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, settling for bad doctrine that brings an immediate comfort overlooking a greater comfort that, a comfort that would come later on. See, I've known pastors who ignored those grow your congregation quick things and instead just depended on the Holy Spirit and their church did grow and they didn't have to change the gospel. The gospel was still all about Jesus. Well, what was different? They didn't settle for a bad doctrine that would give them immediate comfort. They settled for God's doctrine, which gave a lasting comfort. Right. How uh, the, the situation of, uh, of Daddy... If you stop and think about it, how is that going to give me any real comfort? He's my daddy. Versus, I've been adopted as God's child, and he is my protector. That's a lot more important than calling him daddy. Yeah. Right. See what I mean? A greater comfort is there if we stick to seeking God rather than expecting these, you know, feel-good things. Um, also, about to establish it, people look, overlook this a lot. You should never jump into Christianity. You should never do that. You should never just hop right in there. You should never, ever, ever just hop into ministry. You should never do those things. This is what Jesus said to do. Way before you commit, count the cost, and then take up your cross. He didn't say, grab the cross, run really fast out, out the door, and then realize, oh, maybe I don't have what it takes. See what I mean? Because what it takes is submission to God. Are you willing to live your life in submission to God? No? Well, then you won't be able to live for God. Because it's not about how much you can accomplish. See what I mean? People try to make it where there's this thing of, of how far can I make it? Not very far with that attitude. Um, so way before you commit, way before you commit to a ministry, do I have the time of my week to spare? And if, if not, am I willing to change my week schedule around? Because if you think you're going to be able to take up more work without moving anything around your schedule, you're dreaming. That's wrong. I've tried it before multiple times in college and grad school. I, I tried it. It doesn't work. You ha Something has to move somewhere. See what I mean? And that goes for whether you're taking a new job, a new ministry, whatever. And so it's the exact same thing with becoming Christ's disciple. God never intended for people to say that they're going to be a Christian and then live however they want. The American Christian is what I call it. Where you're still living for the world, you're just calling yourself a Christian. Okay? God in anticipated people realizing the cost of discipleship, giving up all you have, holding nothing back from God, and pursuing His desires, and then committing. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Instead, we, we just try to focus people so much on, on submit your life to God, which is a good thing, but maybe they should actually know what that is that they're getting into. Yeah. See what I mean? Because discipleship isn't something that's for some Christians. Discipleship is something that's for all Christians that we're all working towards if we are saved. You see what I mean? Something that, that, that God's doing in all of us. Um, don't overcommit. Know your limitations. This goes right hand in hand with that one before. What people try to do is they try to get gung-ho and they try to sign up for everything. A disciple, a disciple is supposed to volunteer? He's supposed to get involved in ministry? I'll do all of it. Well, <laughs> Bad idea. Um, know your own limitations about, you know, so you don't burn yourself out and get tired of all of it. But then know your limitations as far as how much time you're able to commit to something. You know what I mean? Um, well, I want to join the worship team. Okay, well, do you realize that we have practice on one day? We have at least two services that you're going to have to do a week. Um, you, there's a new song a month that you have to, have, to, have to hear and prepare for, and then we practice it as a group. Um, you know, you have to give out a chunk of your time. There's usually meetings throughout the year. Is this something that you're up for? See what I mean? Um, and it's just, I'm not just talking about one ministry. I'm talking about life in general. Don't overcommit to things. Know your limitations. Um, a lot of times what we do is we want to change our lives. or We want to change, you know, things. And we want to feel like we're accomplished. So we try and, like, go 
to the other extreme. Right. Rather than not doing anything, we try to do everything all at once. Well, it's like, okay, it's like this. If you want to go to college, for instance, go to college and then do that other thing later. See what I mean? I did this. I was trying to go to grad school. I was trying to get uh, certified in this, that, and the other thing. I was trying to do all these different different things. Well, surprise, surprise, it was too much. How about step back from those things, make a list, and do them one at a time? See what I mean? That's what Serena's doing. Uh-huh. She doesn't have a bunch of stuff on her plate. She's got work, kids, college. That's it. She's not trying to get certified to be a psychologist. She's not trying to get certified to teach school. No, she's not doing that stuff. She's doing college. And then when she's done with college, she's going to go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Planning it out. And that's what I'm talking about way before you commit. Um, also, not all favors are helpful. I'll give two examples of this. The first is when you... Nicole, I'm going to do you a big favor. I'm going to go over and mow your lawn for you, okay? Now, I'm going to wait till she's at work, and then I'm going to go over there and call her a hundred times to make sure that the gate's unlocked so I can get in tomorrow, tomorrow lawn. So she has to leave work, come home, unlock the gate for me, and then go back to work. Did I really do her a favor? No. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? A lot of times we try to do people favors while uh-huh. we have them work their whole schedule around us doing them a favor. Right. See what I mean? Like, that's not very favor-ish. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Has anybody ever done that to you guys? Oh. Buddy. Oh, my gosh. I had this one person. Oh, my gosh. i have been asking them to help me for something for, like, eight months. <laughs> Finally, they go the one time I can't do it. And they're like, well, you said you needed my help. And they're all mad at me and everything. I was like, well, th- you could have, we could have set something up ahead of schedule. Like last week. If you want to do it this week, just tell me last week that you want to do it this week. You know what I mean? Right. So once again, not all favors are helpful. Another one is giving money. We see somebody in need and our first reaction is money. I mean, it, it's easy. You don't have to think about what they actually need. You don't have to really talk to them that much. It's just a real quick, easy fix. Here's some money. But oftentimes, it actually hurts the situation. And here's just a few examples that I've seen where people stop coming to church because they're ashamed or they don't, can't pay it back or whatever. Um, or where people could never really afford to pay you back in the first place and they were just kind of asking for a loan, hoping that you would say, keep it. Mm. I've seen that happen before, oh, too. Yeah. And then the person said, oh, just pay me back when you can. And instantly you see their eyes like, oh, no. <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, another example is when somebody um, is refusing to grow in maturity, like refusing to get a job when they are fully able to, mm-hmm. and are just leeching off of people. So they're not, they're not helping society. They're not helping themselves. They're just in the same rut, going through the same thing over and over again, right. and having to burn out all their bridges with everybody around them, hoping that somebody will, will give them a sympathy. See what I mean? All the while they're saying, oh, it's your fault. And it's like, no, you need to grow in maturity because it's actually your fault that you're in the situation. And you need to create a plan to get out of it. See what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, and then they always yell at you like it's your fault. Eh, I don't know. Somehow, other people's lack of financial understanding is always the pastor's fault. I never understood that. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is not a piggy bank. Well, because he didn't say one of those bless me prayers. But honestly, I think, I think that that might be what it is. People have a misunderstanding of what the church is. The church is us. Yeah. Not a building. Right. We are the church. And we don't give financial handouts. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we help people. Aid. Do what? We're not financial aid. We're not aid. financial aid office. Right. That's that's over in Alamo at NMSUA, okay? <laughs> what we do <laughs> what we do is we help people grow closer Dude. to God and change their lives. Right. But growing closer to God isn't not isn't just about spiritual things, is it? We talked about this before, huh? Being closer to God also involves physical things like financial wisdom, uh-huh. like hard work. See what I mean? That's discipleship too. Yeah. See what I mean? And discipleship encompasses all that. So, um, not all favors are helpful. Yeah. No, oh my gosh, I cannot say that one enough. Uh, this one is just what I said before: don't do favors that inconvenience people. <laughs> um, as a general w- rule, if you're if you're if your heart is set on doing a favor for someone. Make sure that, that you do it for their best. Like, here's another example. When you go to apologize to someone and you make it as awkward and, and, as, and as out of their way as possible. Chuck, I'm going to come to you while you're at work, when you're in the middle of a project, and pull you aside. Or maybe not even pull you aside, just in front of people. Why not? Hey, Chuck, remember that time that I slept with your sister? Well, I'm sorry for doing that. 
And everybody's like, okay, this maybe could have been handled somewhere else. That's exactly my point. Uh-huh. It could have been handled somewhere else. Right. See what I mean? Even with apologies, you don't need to inconvenience people when you're apologizing exactly. to them. Wait till they have the time when they're not mad, that kind of stuff. But anyways, I didn't sleep with a sister. <laughs> so, uh, we're about done. Sometimes people will be offended no matter what you do. However... Never, ever, ever get the idea of, well, I can't, it's, they're going to be upset no matter what I do, so I'm just going to do whatever. Never get that idea in your mind, in your, in your head. Realize that no matter what you do, somebody's going to be upset somewhere, but never get the, get the mindset up here of, well, they're just going to have, I'm going to do it anyways, and that's their problem. Never get that mindset. Try your very best not to upset people. Oh. You will upset people. But try your very best not to. Do you understand the difference? Uh-huh. The difference is the heart. <laughs> the heart says, I'm not setting out to offend my brother or sister. See what I mean? Difference. <laughs> so, um, when you get in that kind of, a, a kind of mindset, you overlook compassion, you overlook mercy, you overlook love. Um, as a general rule in discipleship, never be rash in decision making. Just be patient. Whether you're making a life decision or whether you're making a decision about arguing back with someone who said something that you think is extremely stupid, never be rash. Be patient. Oftentimes, closing your mouth can save you so much time and uh, and energy, and then you won't have to go back and apologize for something stupid you did in the first place. <laughs> I was just thinking about in, in the book of James how he talks about... Um, he all goes to this big thing about people's mouths and basically uh, says it, the mouth is just a, ba- a bad thing and you just keep it closed. <laughs> <laughs> so be diligent in prayer. Oftentimes something will come by that looks like an opportunity, that looks like a, a chance for success, and it'll actually be a trap. I'll give you a couple examples that actually I talked to someone about. They were looking at this car as just the best opportunity in their life. They were so excited about it but they didn't have the money on hand, and I advised them, you do not have the money to buy this, okay? And they said, this is just too good of an opportunity, so they went ahead and bought it. Well, lo and behold, they couldn't afford the payments, so the, the, they took the car back, where they call it repossessed, mm-hmm. and um, and their credit score went, went down, and so they had to, um, they weren't able to get the certain house that they wanted to get. And by house, I mean to rent, not to own. They couldn't get this house to rent. The the landlord was one that did check the check the credit and it popped uh-huh. it down too low and he, he said you can't you can't live here. So they had to go live in some place that they didn't want to live in. See what I mean? Uh-huh. So their whole life was affected by something that appeared to be an opportunity, but it was actually a trap. Uh-huh. Um, I've seen other people see a job offer come by and they say, Oh, this looks like a really good job and it's opportunity and then they took it and they were sorry for it. You know what I mean, and then and, and, and it's always harder to to deal with these kinds of people because like, oftentimes they'll ask you for advice, but not because they want to know what is a wise decision. They'll ask you for advice so you affirm what they want to do yeah. already. Right, you that they're I mean? already got it in mind. Right, right. Like, uh, pastor tells a story that so relates. How he wanted to go to California, and so he's praying, and God said, "Well, you're gonna go anyways." You know what I mean? Like, he was asking for God to basically tell Say, him what he wanted to yeah. hear. He's, and so God told him, you're going to go anyways. You know what I mean? And Dad knew he wasn't supposed to go, and he went anyways. A perfect example of this. Uh, um, so how do we avoid those kinds of things? By prayer. Because oftentimes traps look very, very good. Oftentimes they look very, very good. It wouldn't be a trap if there was no allure. They disguise. Mind. Right. Traps. Have you guys have you guys ever set up a snare for uh, for catching uh-huh. for catching wild animals? Yeah. Yeah. The trick is to do it where they don't know that they're walking into a trap. Uh, right. <laughs> when you're setting up a cat trap, for instance, you you cover up the top with like something where where it seems like just a hole or something like that, and then you you have it where it's open. You you know where you don't. It's yeah. all natural. Right. Habitat. Where it seems like it's something that they want to go in. Maybe yeah. even put it on their on their walking path where they've uh-huh. been walking in the line and everything, so they have to cross it on their natural path. So you know what I mean? Something to entice them. Uh-huh. That's why it's called a trap. So with with opportunities that come by, always be slow to react to, is this an opportunity or is this a trap? Right. Um, I, I recently had a, a wonderful job offer come by. That is exactly what I've always wanted. And uh, 
really would would have set me up financially pretty good. Uh, and um, at the last minute, I decided not to take it, and it turned out that it would have been a huge trap. Yeah. And it wouldn't have just affected me, it would, it would have affected the whole church, too. Oh. See what I mean? How was I able to discern? Well, by asking from people who wouldn't tickle my ears, right. and from prayer. A lot of prayer. A lot of prayer. See what I mean? Be diligent in prayer. It will save you from those times of traps. So how do you balance mercy with justice? Write this down or you think this is not something we're going to look at today. This is kind of leading into the question of the week. How do you balance mercy with justice? How do you do the right thing while showing mercy to people? The rapists, for instance, do they deserve to go to jail or do they deserve mercy? See what I mean? But the Bible says that mercy is over judgment. So what's the deal with that? How do you balance mercy? Mercy with ju- with uh, justice. People getting what they deserve versus withholding what they deserve. And when you've got that written down, tell me, okay? Checks right and faster than all y'all. <laughs> and everyone uh-huh. wants size pen move. Uh-huh. Uh, is anybody st- still writing it down? So the question of the week, when should church leaders bring discipline to someone in error? This kind of goes hand in hand with that last question too. So make sure you put it somewhere on your page where you're going to remember both of them for next week's discussion. When should church leaders bring discipline to someone in error? Hmm. 